Well, hey, good morning again, and welcome to church. You guys fired up this morning? Come on, I'm excited. The sun is shining. It's going to hit over 50 degrees today, and that's a good reason for anybody in Michigan to shout hallelujah, amen. Jesus is coming back. You know what I'm saying? All right? Not yet. We got a message today, all right? So, uh, man, I'm so glad to be here with you guys. I'm so glad to be in this series. If you guys are joining us uh, for your first time or or the first time in the last few weeks, we are in uh, week two of a series we've titled The Book of James, all right? And so as a church, we're going through the entire New Testament book of James, which might sound intimidating, but it's actually a very short book. It's only five short chapters. Uh, It's one of those books you can actually sit down in about 15, 20 minutes, read it in its entirety, uh, and get some great context out of that. And and we're doing this together. I love, there's one thing to like study this separately, but to do this together as a community, as a church, is really rewarding and really fruitful. And so in case you're joining us for the first time and you're like, what are we doing in this series? What we're challenging everybody to do is join us in the book of James reading plan. And so what that looks like is each week you read during the week the next book of James or the next chapter of James that we're going to be covering, all right? So for today, for example, we're covering chapter two. So many of you that have been on this journey with us all this previous week, we're reading James chapter two multiple times, not just once, Read it a couple times. What we've been doing is reading it once every day, but out of a different Bible translation, just to get a different angle of it, pull something differently out. And so just as in case you're here for your first time or jumping into this series with us, next week, this following week, if you want to read James chapter 3 and then come back, we will be led by the Spirit of what we're going to cover. Because here's the deal. I'm not going to read every single verse in each chapter when we get up here. And and we're going to just trust the Holy Spirit. He knows what we need to emphasize and what we need to camp out on. And so we're just going to go from that place knowing that if we've all kind of read it ahead of time, we've got it in our heart, we've got it in our head. And so then the Lord can really go deeper in that uh, chapter of James. And so that's how we're going to be doing it here. Um, But like I mentioned before, James is short, but don't let its size fool you. All right? It is powerful. It is an amazing uh, New Testament book, and it's referred to as an epistle which is just a really Bible churchy word uh, for a letter, all right? It's a letter written to believers. So yes, it was written to believers back then, but it's it's one of those circular books is what Bible scholars say. So it could be taken to church, to church, to church, to church, and downloaded for each context of that church, and we can learn something. So even though it was written a long time ago, guess what? It applies to a live family church, and it applies to our our lives and our spiritual walks today, which is really exciting. Uh, We looked at last week just a little bit of context. Who wrote this? A guy named James, obviously. Uh, But this was James who was the half-brother of Jesus, all right? So you remember Mary and Joseph? Joseph's uh, one of his sons, James, right? Uh, So Jesus is half-brother because Jesus obviously was born through Mary through the Holy Spirit. So that's where you get the half-brother in that family context. So he grew up watching Jesus do all this stuff, and he didn't even believe. He was a skeptic at first, but later became a believer. So I love his perspective on things. And, um, you know, I I said it this last week, but I'll say it again. I love the book of James, and you know why? Because it goes right for the jugular of our faith, all right? Like, I, I, James doesn't sugarcoat things. He doesn't, like, say it nice and flowery. He just gets in there and says, you want to know what real faith is? It's this, right? And so we're looking here not only to grow our knowledge of God's word, but in this series to really grow our faith. We want to have faith that pleases God, and we want faith that works, amen? And so we're going to look in today and really lean into God's word in James chapter 2. And, and before I jump in and, and read some of the stuff that we're going to cover today, I think it's important to just take a quick side note and realize that when the Bible was written, it wasn't originally written with chapters and scripture verse references, all right? So just important to realize that. So yes, the book of James uh, is five chapters, which helps us out. That's a five-week series, right? And we can break it down so we're not trying to cover everything in one Sunday, which is helpful. But just realize the the chapters and the verses were added way later just for our personal benefit of being able to reference scripture and find it easier. But this book of James wasn't five random things. It was one continuous letter. So just realize as we jump into James chapter 2 today, it's not some random blurred out afterthought that doesn't have any relation to what we covered last week in chapter 1. No, it's a continuation of some of the stuff we talked about last week. So if you hear what I'm talking about today, and it sounds a lot like don't just be a hearer of the word, but a doer also, it's because James is milking this concept throughout multiple different chapters of the book of James because it's one long letter. And, and he's building a thing, and what, what's at the end of the letter also has tentacles back to the very first chapter of the letter, if that makes sense. And so that'll just help us study the book better and realize that, oh, wow, maybe God's trying to get our attention on something. Amen? And so let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive right into James chapter 2. 
Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we just thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can be here in your presence, and we thank you for your word. Your word is truth, Lord. It's living. It's active. It's powerful. We know that it says that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path that leads us and guides us in the way we should go. And so, Father, we want every heart to be open. I pray that every eye and every ear would be open to see what you have for us this morning, to receive from heaven what you have for us. Holy Spirit, I ask you to customize this message for every person under the sound of my voice, Lord. You know where we're at. You know where we're called to be. And you know what's going to get us there. And so, Lord, we just trust you for impact and increase and impartation this morning in a fresh and new way as we open up James chapter 2. Lord, we love you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed, said, amen. amen. So James chapter 2. So if you guys read it, you know, it's not very long. There's not tons of verses in chapter 2. The first 13 verses of James chapter 2, he talks about this one concept uh, about favoritism, and I want to just camp out just for a moment here. I'm not going to read any of the scriptures from that or go on that because I really want to focus on the second half, but it's important to realize this is really great for us as a community and even in our society and our culture today. James attacks favoritism and showing favoritism among people in faith. He says real faith doesn't show special treatment to certain people, amen? He says, you know, faith and and, and you know, prejudice cannot coexist, amen? And so I love that. That's a great message for our culture, for our generation. If we're gonna be people of faith, we're, we're called to show mercy to all, not just the ones that look like they have it all together. Or like, like he said in the Bible there in the first couple verses, like they come in and they're nicely dressed and they have fine clothes. Come here, sit here at this nice seat, but all oh, somebody else looks a little down and out. You, uh, you can sit on the floor at my feet, right? No, no, he said, that doesn't exist when we're operating in true, real genuine faith. I love that personal challenge for ourselves as a community that we'd always be a come-as-you-are culture, amen? No matter where you're from, no matter what your socioeconomic status is, no matter what your upbringing has been like, no matter how much money you have or don't have, no matter uh, what you wear or what you don't wear, God still loves you, amen? God still has a plan and a purpose, and so we'll forever be a come-as-you-are type church, amen? And show mercy to all because, man, we've been shown great mercy, amen? And so we cannot play judge in anyone's life, amen? But what I really want to talk about today and spend the most of our time is on the second half of James chapter 2, and that starts verses 14 through 26. That kind of takes us through the end there for most of it, and uh, I really want to read this together because we're going to see a repetitive theme here that you're going to hear as I read through these passages of scripture, and it goes a little something like this. Faith without works is dead, all right? And we're going to talk about what that means in a second, but I just want you to see that repetitive theme as we read. So if you guys got your Bibles, you want to turn those on, or we'll have it on the screens as well. James chapter 2, starting in verse 14 all the way through 26. I'm going to read it out of the New King James Version for you guys. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? If a brother or a sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? There it is again. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Verse 26, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we see this theme here. You've heard that like three different times. James says, faith without works is dead, right? So obviously, repetition is important when you're wanting someone to remember something, right? If you're writing a letter to somebody and three times you repeat yourself, wouldn't you think that that is important, right? And so we lean into this because obviously the Holy Spirit through James is trying to get all of our attention as believers of this concept here. Now, faith without works. Everybody say works. 
What is that talking about? Faith without work. Does that mean going to your job and working? No, it's not talking about that. Faith without works. If you study out the, the Greek word for the word works here used, it's, called, it, it's pronounced ergon. And the New Testament was written in Greek originally and the Old was written in Hebrew. So if you study that meaning out here, uh, it, it really means an act, a deed, or a thing done. So faith without an act or a deed or a thing done is dead. Basically what he's saying here, faith without action is dead. I'm like, wow, dang, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Faith or belief without corresponding action or an outflow is, is dead, right? And it, it's, it, I love how um, some of the other Bible translations, maybe the more progressive ones, the message and, and the passions translation, translates James chapter 2, verse 17. Check this out. We got it uh, for the screens for you guys. Starting in uh, James 2.17 in the message, it says, Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I like that. Right? A lot of us can talk the talk. We know some scripture. We can know enough to be dangerous. But without God acts, without acts of faith, it's kind of ridiculous and outrageous, right? I love what the Passion Translation says it this way. So then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. Wow. That's just keeping it real, right? Like, I don't know about you guys, I don't want phony faith. Right? I don't want fake faith. I don't want to like, pretend like I have faith. I want to really have faith because I know the Bible says in Hebrews that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? I believe we all want our belief not to just be some head knowledge, some religion, some do's and don'ts and try to get us together and make, a, make us feel morally better than like, a bunch of other people in our society so maybe we'll get into heaven. God's not about that at all. He's about true, real, genuine faith. And he doesn't want it to be fake or phony. He wants it to be real and alive and working in our lives. And so James is like, hey, there's a difference here between fake faith and real faith, right? And when you think about it, faith without action or an outflow really is not really that impressive. Like a couple analogies for you guys. It it would be like us having a car without gasoline, right? You guys ever been there before in a jam where you thought you could faith it to the next exit and it just didn't work out? Yeah, I've been there twice in my life, all right? Didn't learn my lesson once, I did it again, right? When you have a car, you have all the potential in the world to go places. But without gas, that car's dead, right? I don't care what you got. You are sitting on the side of that road until you fill that gas can up, right? I I like to put it this way. Faith without works, it's like a million-dollar check written out to you, but with no signature or endorsement on the end. You know what I'm saying? How much money do you have, really, if you don't sign that sucker and take it to the bank? Zero, zilch, nada. It has all the potential in the world to change your financial status, amen? But without action or outflow or uh, some work, it it doesn't do anything. For those of you guys that maybe skip breakfast or or are hungry today, maybe you'll get this analogy because we had this on Monday night for dinner. Faith without works is like biscuits without gravy. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, come on, that's some good preaching right now, right? Biscuits are good in and of themselves. And gravy is okay by itself. But when you put those two together on a plate, it's like 1999 or 1993 NBA Jam boom shakalaka is like I like to say, all right? Like you put that sausage gravy on that biscuit, oh my goodness. That is some good preaching right now, right? Like, but without it, it's just kind of like a biscuit and gravy, which is good. But man, it's so much better with the action, right? It's so much better when it's paired together for us to eat, amen? And and so we ain't hangry in this place this morning, amen? We're just hungry for more of God's word, amen? We're hungry for real faith, faith that works. And so I've learned this uh, over my short life and short journey with the Lord so far. I don't have it all figured out, but one thing I've seen, and I've seen time and time again in my life, is that in order for faith to work, you have to work that faith. Amen. In order for faith to work, you're going to have to work that faith. If you like to take notes, my, my message title is Work That Faith This Morning, all right? Because here's the deal what, with the car situation, right? You not only have to believe that the car is able to drive when you put gas in it, but guess what? What do you got to do? You actually got to go to that gas pump and pump some gas into that car. If you believe the car can take you somewhere, you got to put some faith, you got to work that faith to make it work, amen? For the million dollar check with your name and somebody else's signature, all you gotta do is flip that sucker over the back, sign that, and take it to a legit financial institution, and hallelujah, you're a millionaire. 
But you got to work that faith, right? Otherwise, without it, it's dead, right? And for the biscuits and gravy, let's come back to that. Come on, there's a good anointing on that this morning, right? Right? you got to actually not only believe that biscuits and gravy taste good, because we already know they do, but for, 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 the, for the example, you got to take out a plate. you got to take a nice hot biscuit out of the oven. you got to take that ladle and that nice hot sausage gravy. Oh, man, it's just been simmering there, right? you got to douse that and pour that gently over that biscuit, right? And you need to eat it. you got to work that faith. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you guys are so excited and so stirred up right now, you're going to run out to Cracker Barrel after service today, and you're going to taste what faith with works literally tastes like, all right? And that's okay. There's no judgment on that. Eat one for me, please, okay? But I love these analogies. They're silly. We, we, we laugh about them, but man, we are called to work that faith. But I think what happens is we can fall into this trap as believers. When we talk about faith or we reference this, it's hard to grasp concept of faith we usually speak about faith in general terms. And what I mean by that is like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a person of faith. You'll hear that a lot. Or, oh, yeah, I believe in God. Or, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian, right? And, and we take it only as far as belief in God. Now, that is the baseline. That's the most important thing. Without that, we have no basis of salvation. We have no basis of anything in God's word without belief in it, right? So that's important, But James is saying he's talking to believers who already believe. Remember, the context of this letter is we already are all down with Jesus. We already understand who Jesus is and we serve him and we love him. We've received him, but we need to operate in faith. We need to do something with that belief, right? Because James makes this pretty harsh analogy, right? I don't know if you caught it here when I read it, but we're going to read it again. Between us, when we think we have faith and we just believe, it puts us on the same level as demons, right? I don't know about you guys. I read that. I'm reading through good stuff, and I hear that we're demons. I'm like, what, what in the world are they talking about here? What's he talking about? In James chapter 2, verse 19, he says, you believe that there is one God. You do well or good for you. Even the demons believe and tremble. What's that all about? He's saying, hey, even the demons believe that there is one God. They have a belief. In God, but the difference between demons and people of faith should be that the demons don't act on their belief. They don't produce action corresponding to that faith. They actually hate God. They know that God's God, but they hate God, and they're out on mission to steal, kill, and destroy everything that is for God in the kingdom of God. Amen? And so we don't want to just be on that same level where we just believe, but we don't actually ever do anything with our belief. We don't act like it is so and it is true because otherwise that's putting us in the same category as demons. I don't know about you. I don't want to be in the same category as a demon. Amen? Praise God. He's coming to set us free by his truth this morning, right? And so James, he's trying to wake us up. He's trying to stir us up as believers saying, hey, real faith isn't just belief. That's important, but it isn't just the believing part. Right? Real faith isn't just head knowledge. Real faith isn't just mental assent. Right? Real faith produces action. It produces works that line up with that corresponding belief. Right? Because faith without works is dead. And I don't know about you, a dead faith is worse than any faith at all. Right? A dead faith is going to be worse than any faith at all. And guys, I can relate to this. I always like, like to point the own finger at myself and, and not pretend like I know everything. Here's the deal. I grew up believing in God, like that James verse with the demons. I, I knew that God was God, but I didn't, I didn't have any outflow of works in my life that lined up to that belief. I would do all the right religious things. I would go to a couple services a year to make myself feel better than somebody else who doesn't go to church, and I would say all the right things when I was there, but it was, it was dead to me, to be honest with you. Church was dry, church was boring, and it was dead. It was works only. If I could do the right things or say the right things or dress the right way or get in with the right people, then maybe I will get to heaven. You know what that's called? That's called religion. And Jesus came to set us free from the spirit of religion. Amen? One bunch of works trying to get ourselves to God without believing and have a relationship with God. And then from that place of a heartfelt belief and relationship outpouring into works that line up and are beating to us, that's how God wants it to work. But we are like creatures of heaven. Sometimes we get in this rut of, I'll just do a bunch of great God stuff, but not have God action in my life. And God's like, I don't want that. You can have your religion. You can keep your religion. You're going to get burnt out on trying to do that. 
trying to be perfect, trying to level up to, to some standard that is impossible for us in our own strength to accomplish without a personal relationship with God. And so you're hearing works, faith without works, 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 but yet we just said, hey, works to trying to get ourselves to God is, is religion, right? And some of you might be thinking, if you guys have studied other New Testament stuff, is this contradicting what the Apostle Paul taught? Because we know the Apostle Paul was big on grace and big on faith, right? He said, you are saved by grace through faith, right? Not works so that no man could boast, right? And that's true, right? And, and over and over, and I don't have this for the screen, but in Romans 3.28, Paul said, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, right? So, so Paul is preaching faith justifies us as a believer, Okay which is a true fact, right? Then you hear James, and you hear in James 2.14, he says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can faith save him? He's like, no, faith alone without the producing works cannot save him. And so James is saying, hey, here's the deal. We need to take it a step further. Now, don't catch this and misinterpret this. This isn't us trying to go out now and produce works that pleases God. You've got to understand the context of two, these two guys and who they're writing to. Paul, the Apostle Paul, is speaking to religious people. People that wanted to follow the Mosaic Levitical law to a T to try to get their way to God. And he had to set these dudes free and set these people free. Why? Because they would never be good enough to get to God and maintain that 100% of the time. We are all imperfect people, and we all fail, and we all miss the mark. That's why we needed Jesus to come, right? So he's talking to people that are a little too gung-ho on the law, 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 and trying to do all these works. So he said, hey, faith, man, faith, faith, grace, and faith, that's what saves you, right? James is talking to believers who believe there is a God but aren't doing anything with that belief, Right, we talked about last week, these guys were growing in their faith. They believed in Jesus. Then Stephen got stoned. One of their, their closest bros got killed for their faith. And they all scattered. And they got nervous. They got scared. And no one actually was doing anything with their faith. They were just kind of like, I believe, but I don't want anybody to know because I might die like Stephen. And so he's challenging them to man up in their faith, to, to take it further than just a belief, but to do something with their faith. That's a challenge, right? And remember, it's, it's to us as believers and so what helps us? James, James isn't saying that we, we, we just, we, we we're not believing or we believe but we don't do anything. James wouldn't disagree with the Apostle Paul. He would agree that faith is what saves us, but he's talking about faith isn't the only basis, right? That like, like there's a work, there's an outflow, there's an action that comes with this. We know that Paul goes on in Galatians and says, faith working itself out by love. So Paul would agree too that there's going to be some fruit that comes from genuine faith. Amen. Amen. And so God's calling us to do this. So what helps us get out of this heady faith, this stale faith, this religious faith? And it's a word that sometimes evokes different emotions, but I want you guys to repeat it after me. Say obedience. obedience. Ooh, obedience. When some of us say that, it's not hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It's like, ah, right? It's like, uh-oh, what's going on here? But as we see, I love what the amplified translation of the Bible says in, in two passages here in James chapter 2. And it uses the word of works of obedience, right? So check this out. James chapter 2, verse 17. So also faith, if it does not have works, deeds, and actions of, say it with me, obedience to back it up by itself is destitute of power. It's inoperative. It's dead. Then you go on a little bit further. James 2, 26 in the Amplified says, For as the human body apart from the spirit is lifeless, so faith apart from its works of, say it again, obedience is also dead. And so what, what is James trying to get our attention on here in these passages? He's trying to get our attention that real faith produces action and obedience in our life. Real faith does, right? And one of the examples he gives, if you guys read that with me in the beginning there, is Abraham. And I want to go back and read the three verses where it talks about Abraham as our example of faith because I believe we can learn a lot from this and his example. So he goes on in James 2, 21 through 23. We read this earlier in the beginning of service. So let's read it again. It says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. You see that then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. 
And so James references Abraham and specifically the the part in Abraham's journey where he was called by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. And this would take us back to Genesis chapter 2 if you want to go back and study that exact account and all the details there. For time's sake, we're not going to go back and look at that today. For those of you guys that have been with us for a while in the Running with Giants Faith series we did in November, we talked a lot about Abraham. We actually referenced this part uh, in scripture and whatnot. But for those of you guys that aren't familiar with Abraham's story, just a quick Quick highlight reel, like ESPN, all right, for, for Abraham. He was a man after God's own heart. He was a God follower. God comes to him and says, get out of your comfort zone, get out of your land, and go to a place I'll show you. I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. And he immediately drops his bags, packs his bags, and then goes and, and takes action immediately. Then he says, hey, I got a promise for you. You're, you're, you're going to be the father of many nations. And he's like, what? My wife Sarah's old age and she's barren. We have no kids. How is that even going to happen? But he believes. They take action. Then he comes to him again and says, you know what? You're going to bear a son. His name's going to be Isaac. And, and they eventually do that and they take action. And Isaac is born the son of the promise. Like the one through all the numerous descendants as much as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. That's the promised son. And he comes to Abraham and he says, I want you to sacrifice that son on the altar. I don't know about you guys. I would probably bat a couple eyes. Be like, are you sure, God? Are, are you confused, God? What, what have you been smoking, God? Like, like, that's the son of the promise. Like, no, 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 we don't kill the promise. But Abraham doesn't do that at all. It's quick and instant obedience from Abraham. It's quick action. It's faith with works. He says, you know what? And he starts going. And Abraham goes as far as cocking back the flint knife that he has on his son of the promise. And right before he's about to do it, an angel appears and says, Abraham, don't do that. And God stops it and provides. But Abraham was willing to do it. He believed God so much and he acted in faith that even if he killed his son, he would believe that God would raise him from the dead or work something else out because he believed God's word over anything else, any popular opinion, anything in culture. He said, I live to serve and please God. I'm a man of faith. And if God said it, I'm going to do it. And if I'm going to do it, then God can work it all out. Amen? But he, he took action. Talk about obedience. Talk about sacrifice. Abraham not only believed God, but he acted on that belief, right? He, he, and God called that faith. And all over the, the scriptures, you see Abraham is like known as the father of faith. And he's used multiple different times and different, Paul uses him, reference him in Romans. And, and a lot of these guys, these writers are referencing Abraham because man, that is the example. That's real faith. Not just believing. Yeah, God, I know you made a promise, but I'll figure it out in my own way. No, doing it God's way in obedience and taking a step and doing something with our faith. Abraham, he, he gets James chapter 1. He wasn't just a hearer of God's word. He was a doer of God's word. Amen? He didn't just hear the promise and hear the challenge and hear the sacrifice. He actually did it. He put his faith on the line and his belief and trust on the line and stepped out in action. And so here's the deal, guys. Believing God with real faith and following God with real faith is never always easy. <laughs> I'm not here to promise you that, and God isn't either. It's usually, it's pretty tough to honestly do that. It's not the social cool thing to do, right? Coming to church on Sunday or, you know, getting involved in a crew or a small group or volunteering at a church or whatever it is. That, that's not the cool, popular thing in our culture, right? It's not always guaranteed and easy, right? It may not always make sense to everyone outside or even family members or friends, but here's what I know. We aren't called to please people. We're called to serve and worship and please who? God, amen? And so no matter what people think or what they don't think, that doesn't determine my faith. My faith is I believe, but then I take action on what I believe, and that is what helps works that faith out of my life, amen? Everybody say, work that faith. We gotta work that faith, right? We gotta not just talk the talk, we gotta walk the walk, walk by faith, not by sight, right? And so the big question this week, what, how do we respond to James's encouragement to not just have faith without works, but to have faith with action? It's this, last week my big challenge and God's big challenge was us, what word from God are you hearing that you need to start doing, right? This week, I feel like God is challenging us with this. What do you believe that you need to start taking action on? What is that word 
that God is stirring you for, that faith, that belief that you have that God is pushing you one step further out of your comfort zone to start acting on that belief, to, to put feet to your faith and to walk that thing out because, man, I believe that's where breakthrough happens. And it might be in a bunch of different areas for us. It might look different for each and every one of us, and that's okay. You just let the Holy Spirit really work on your own heart and your own life and where you're at right now with God. And what does that mean for me? What do I believe that I need to take action on? Something that's been being stirred up multiple weeks in a row here, because obviously I believe God's working on us, is for us to share our faith with others. It's easy to like be comfortable with the people we love and we got to know here and this nice little, you know, great thing. But it, it's scary to like be bold for Jesus out there at our work and in the community with the moms at the play dates and all of that stuff. Like that's scary. But I believe God's stirring us, right? Because what do we believe? Do we believe that as a Jesus follower, part of our calling is to share the good news with others? Remember we did the red letter series, right? Do we believe that the, some of the last words that Jesus spoke we're called the Great Commission. They challenge all of us as followers to share the good news with other people. If we believe that, that's one thing. Even the demons believe that. It's another thing to actually do. And I like to point the finger here first. This one's, this one's really sobering. In the last year, how many people have you shared your faith with personally outside of a church service? Or let's bring it more into context. Maybe you're not cool with that. You don't even know what to say, but you want to invite people to church. In the last six weeks, how many people have you invited to join you at a live and have you brought to church? Right? That's a sobering thought. That's where our faith really is put to the test. If we believe, James is saying, yeah, that's great. That's not going to get any kingdom work done. That's not going to grow any church. That's not going to grow any people until you put feet to your faith and you have action and you have works that correspond out of the goodness and love of God in your heart to share that with others, amen? For some of us, it's moving the needle. Yeah, I come and I come and I consume, which is great. And faith comes by hearing and that's what the church is there for. But the church is the people and the church is serving other people. And if we feel like Jesus said, hey, it's more blessed to give than receive. And it's more blessed to use our time, our treasure, our talent to make a kingdom impact. Then maybe I need to consider jumping on the Alive team and, and serving in maybe once a month or every other week or whatnot, getting on a serve team here and, and actually giving a chance for others to experience what I've experienced to make some more room for some people to experience the goodness of God. Maybe he's moving the needle in our hearts with that, out of obedience. When it comes to our devotion to God, our prayer and our devo time and reading the word, do we believe that prayer can literally change our situation on earth here? Do we believe that prayer produces God's power in our life? And if so, our response is to pray. Not to talk about praying, but actually to pray, right? That's what gets it done, right? To work that faith, right? Not just hope the faith works, but the faith will work, guess what? When you work that faith, amen? Because faith that works and produces works, guess what? It works, amen? There's a lot of works going on, all right? Do we believe God's word is his truth and is his guide and it's eternal and it's powerful and it's not just like, oh man, I guess I'll be a good Christian and try to read the Bible. <gasps> all right, cool, let's go to work and let's go on with our life and not let it change us like most of us do, to be honest, myself included sometimes. No, no, no. If this is God's spoken word and it's living and it's active and it's powerful, then we work that faith by getting in this because we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and, and we want to grow our faith. We got to get in our word, amen? We got to not just do it religiously. I guess I'll read the word. Yeah, I did James like three. I read it out of three different translations. What'd you get out of it? I don't know what happened in there, but I read it. I'm a good Christian because I read it. If you're reading it but not doing it, it does you no good. That's what I've learned. I can know everything. I can memorize this thing and regurgitate it to you every single Sunday, yet not apply any ounce of it in my life. I'd be a horrible person. I'd be a really fake and phony faith, right? God doesn't want that. God wants real heartfelt faith, right? Maybe it's being obedient in other areas of our life, maybe in our financial arena, right? This one, people get nervous about that. But hey, if God says it's more blessed to give than to receive and, and to bring the tithe or the first 10% into the storehouse because I'll pour out a blessing on you and I'll multiply that. I'll take that remaining 90 and make it go further than that 100% that you try to keep to yourself. That's a faith test because we all could use that extra money. We, we got plans to do with that, right? I can't afford to tithe. I can't afford to give. Man, I, I feel like ever since we've been believers, we cannot afford to not tithe. 
because of the promises that are attached to it, that he would rebuke the devourer for my sake, that the windows of heaven would be open, right? What does that mean? Your car goes further and it doesn't cost as much to fix. Your kids are more on the right path than other, you know, there, there's not all these unexpected, we're under God's blessing when we're obedient to God's word. Because again, we know that his word isn't trying to steal from us, it's trying to get something to us, amen? Our good, loving, heavenly father loves us and he would never ask us to do something that's gonna steal from us. So I I had to get set free years ago that tithing isn't God trying to steal 10% of my income. It's for God to try to bless my 90 and make it go further than my own 100. And it takes faith to give that first. I'll give that at the end after all my bills are paid, my 401ks are taken care of, and if I got 10% left, I'll give it. It's a a whole other thing to be like, you get yours first and we'll figure out the rest, God, because I put you, you're my source, amen? You're my source. Paycheck comes and helps pay the bills, but paycheck is not my source. God's my source, amen? God's your source. He can cause anything to come and go whenever he wants, and he owns all of it. It's all of his. All the money's actually God's, not ours, right? We just, we're stewards of it, and we get to work hard and be blessed and, and give and, as the means we have. And so, man, what a great challenge for us to, to step up to faith and say, you know what, where am I at in that arena of my life? God, work on me in that. It's okay. I think it's blessed to give something versus nothing, but man, we start somewhere, but man, God grows us, and when we line up to that, man, it's powerful. And, and I'll, I'll end with this, you know, we're gonna be talking about this in our next series. Maybe, maybe what do we believe? Do we believe that God is a healer? That God wants to heal our physical bodies, our emotional bodies, the junk that we bring into relationships? Do we believe that God is a healer? And that he, that he sent his son Jesus not only to die for our sins, but to take those stripes on his back so that we'd have healing available to us. If we believe that, and if I believe that, then guess what? I don't have to freak out when I go to the doctor and I get a bad report for myself, for my kids. Bless the medical staff. We're all pro doctor here. This is awesome. They give us the facts. This is what we think is going on and this is how we think we should treat it. Awesome. The facts never trump the truth of God's word. Amen? That's what I believe. So yeah, I might, I might start walking down that natural pathway to healing. There's nothing wrong with that, but I believe that my God created my body. He knows it better than any human being or any physician that's studied for a number of years. He knows me intimately. He formed me together in my mother's womb. He knows the number of hairs on my head. He, he made every cell. And so he knows what's going on in that body. He knows how to heal that. When I cut myself, my body begins to naturally heal myself. Even in my own DNA and makeup, I am called to be healthy, whole, and healed. God put that there. No man put that there. Amen? So we trust him and we, we operate in faith. What do we do? We work that faith. Amen? And so I love to end with this. If we know that faith without works is dead, then guess what? I love to flip the script. That means faith with works is alive. Amen? Faith with works works. Amen? It produces the ability for God to open up the door in our lives and come in and do something supernatural in our lives. And so we can have as much belief as we want to take as many classes and go to as many crew sessions and have all this Bible knowledge, but if we don't do anything with it, it's dead, James says. So let us not be a church, let us not be a believer that just has a bunch of head knowledge and agrees with God's word, but instead, man, let's put, let's put our faith to the test, amen? Let's stretch our wings of faith this year and just get out on, on uncharted waters to begin to walk where we've never walked before because we trust God above everything else, amen? God will take you higher, he will take you farther, and he will bless your life as you trust him and you work that faith. When you work that faith, guess what, guys? Your faith will work, amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we just thank you for this morning. We thank you for encouraging us and stirring us up and using James chapter 2 to really continue this being a doer of the word and not a hearer-only concept in our life. Lord God, we don't want to have religion. We don't have a bunch of do's and don'ts to try to get ourselves from you. Jesus, you set us free from that. We're thankful for that. So let us be people of real, authentic, genuine, heartfelt faith. That Lord, we worship you and we serve you and we believe in you. And from that intimacy and that, not that head knowledge, but that heart faith, Lord, out of that flow, all the good works that produce obedience and and blessing in our life, Lord God, that it wouldn't be a burden to serve you in faith. It would be a blessing how you encouraged us to do and how you challenge us to do. And so Holy Spirit, you know where we're at. And I ask you to just customize what has been spoken today. Lord, what do we believe that we need to start taking action on? May our faith produce action. Faith with works is alive. And we thank you, Lord. You're making us more like you each and every day. And so give us the boldness 
and the strength and the courage to trust you and take a step of obedience and faith to whatever you're calling us to in this season. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody greet said, amen.